So the next speaker is Victor Wu at the University of Sydney. He'll be telling us about Basser theory in the C star algebraic context. Go ahead. All right. Thanks, Carl Frederick, for the introduction. And thanks also uh, for the invitation to speak here at this conference. Um, all right. So I'll start off by saying that I'm not a geometric goof theorist. Instead, I'm a C star algebraist who takes inspiration from ideas from geometric goof theory. Uh, so in particular today, I'll be talking about Basser theory, which of course is this foundational part of geometric goof theory. And I want to showcase how it shows up in a C-star algebraic context. Um, now, I won't be assuming any knowledge about C-star algebra, so don't worry. Uh, in a moment, I'll explain what they are, but I won't really be doing anything technical with them in this talk. So you can get by just thinking of them as algebras plus some extra structure. All right. Uh, so let's ease into things with a reminder of what Basset theory is about. So the big idea is that we can understand the structure of groups by studying how they act on trees. Right? So how does this work? Well, if you have a group acting on a tree, now we have to assume that the action doesn't flip any edges, but this is not such a big deal. Then from this action, we can construct what's called a graph of groups. Uh, so we can get a graph by taking the quotient of this tree by the action. So the vertices in the tree, uh, sorry, the vertices in the graph are the vertex orbits in the tree and same for edges. And then we can get a group for each vertex and edge by looking at the corresponding stabilizer subgroups of the vertices and edges in the tree. And then the final piece of data we need for a graph of groups is that the edge groups have to embed as vertex groups um, sorry, embed as subgroups of the vertex groups on either side. Um, but this is automatic here because if a group element fixes an edge in the tree, uh, because we've assumed that the action doesn't flip any edges, the element has to also fix the vertices on either side. And so we get a graph of groups like this. Now, it turns out that we can go the other way as well. So starting with a graph of groups, there's a way to construct a group action on a tree. Uh, and these constructions are mutually inverse. Now, I won't go through the details of this backwards construction, but what we end up with is a one-to-one -one correspondence between graphs of groups on the one hand and group actions on trees on the other. And this is what's known as the fundamental theorem of Basset theory. So in geometric group theory, you then go on and use this to study the structure of the group that acts on the tree. Uh, but if you're interested in C-star algebras like I am, the uh, focus is a bit different. Uh, so let me first give a bit of context about C-star algebra theory. So one of the big themes in the study of C-star algebras is we want to construct classes of C-star algebras, which are both broad so that they capture lots of C-star algebras, uh, but at the same time, we want them to be tractable so that we can actually understand their structure. And one of the main ways we do this is by starting with some nice type of data. So for example, some uh, something combinatorial like a graph, or something dynamical like a group action. Uh, and then we construct C-star algebras from this data, somehow encoding the data. And then we study how the properties of the C-star algebra can be related to the properties of the underlying data. So for us, we have two classes of data in front of us, right? We have graphs of groups, and we also have group actions on trees. And there's a way of constructing C-star algebras from both of these objects. And then a natural question is, well, given that we have this relationship, uh, relationship between the two objects here, is there a relationship between the corresponding C-star algebras? Well, as you might expect, the answer is yes. So I've put this result up on the screen, but it's probably just meaningless symbols to you at the moment. Uh, so in the first half of my talk, I'll you try to give you an understanding of what everything here means. And then after that, I'll discuss how we can use this result to uh, understand and to work with the C-star algebras involved. Um, but now, for now, let me just make a couple of comments about this result. So the first one, which you might have already noticed, is that the underlying data for our C-star algebras is not a graph of groups, but it's a directed graph of groups. Uh, so all this means is I'm choosing directions for each edge in the graph, uh, and then we can lift this to uh, an orientation of the tree over here. And so what we end up getting is a one-to-one -one correspondence between directed graphs of groups and group actions on directed trees. Uh, and the reason I want to do this is because from a C-star algebraic point of view, it turns out that it's more natural to construct C-star algebras from directed objects as opposed to undirected objects. Um, so I will note that the undirected version of this result was given in this five-author paper by Brownlow, Mundy, Pask, Spielberg, and Thomas. Mm -hmm. 
but the C star algebras you get there are, are a bit harder to study. So I'll focus on the directed version in this talk, which is also what I studied for my PhD. Okay. So the basic idea of the result is this. So take some directed graph of groups, and then that will correspond to some group action on a directed tree. Then from both of these objects, we can construct C star algebras. So this is a, some C star algebra coming from the directed graph of groups. And this is some C star algebra coming from the group action. And in a moment, I'll explain how these C star algebras are defined. Um, but the point is we get these C star algebras and they are what's called Marita equivalent. Uh, so essentially, they have the same representation theory. Uh, so they might not be isomorphic, but this is really the second best thing. Uh, and so you can think of this result as some kind of C-star algebraic Bastet theorem. Uh, all right. Now, so that's sort of the basic overview of the result. And now I want to talk about these C-star algebras in more detail. And so I'll put this result up on the corner so that we can refer to it as we go through. Um, all right, so let's start with what are C-star algebras. So like I mentioned in the introduction, you can really think of these as just algebras with some extra structure. Um, so in particular, they have to have a star operation uh, or an adjoint, which is an involution which respects the algebraic operations. At the same time, it needs to be a Barnard space. So it has a norm and it's complete with respect to that norm. And then finally, it needs to satisfy this identity here called the C star identity. Okay, so that's all a bit abstract. So let's look at some examples. Uh, as a first very basic example, you can take just the complex numbers. So of course, these are complex algebra. And then the adjoint operation is given by conjugation. And then the norm is just the modulus. And then this identity here is something that you'd learn in first year calculus or something. Uh, right, so these complex numbers are a C star algebra. Now we can bump this up to matrix algebras as well. Uh, so in this case, the star operation uh, is given by the conjugate transpose. Uh, and then there's a natural norm called the spectral norm, which turns these guys into C star algebras as well. Now, more generally, if you take any Hilbert space, then the bounded linear operators on that Hilbert space also form a C star algebra. Uh, so for example, if the Hilbert space is just C to the N, then the bounded linear operators are precisely the n by n matrices. Now, it turns out that in fact, any C star algebra is a subalgebra of bounded linear operators on some Hilbert space. And so this is called the Gelfand Neimark theorem. Uh, and this means that we can view any C star algebra as some concrete uh, collection of bounded linear operators on a Hilbert space. And so this is another way you can think of uh, C star algebras. All right, and then final example comes from the C0 functions on a locally compact Hausdorff space. So these are the functions that vanish at infinity. Um, and here the operations are all pointwise and the star operation is the pointwise conjugation and the norm is the supremum norm. Uh, so these guys are also a C star algebra. And this is also what's happening up here. Right? So if, if you look here, this is the C0 functions on this space here. This is called the boundary of T plus, and this is something that I'll explain later. Uh, but anyway, this, this part here on the right-hand side, this is the C0 functions on this space. Okay, so those are some concrete examples of C-star algebras. Uh, and now I want to move to talking about uh, ways of building C-star algebras a bit more abstractly. Uh, and I'll be talking about two ways we can do this in this talk. Uh, so the first way we can build C-star algebras is using generators and relations. And right? so much like you can define a group via a presentation, um, given a suitable set of generators and relations, we can construct what's called the universal C-star algebra, which is kind of the biggest C-star algebra with those generators and relations. Uh, so one important example of these are what are called group C-star algebras. So for any discrete group, the C-star algebra of the group is defined to be the universal C star algebra generated by a unitary representation of the group. So what this means is that the generators are just the elements in the group. And of course we have all the group relations, uh, but then we also require that each element of the group has to be a unitary inside the C star algebra. And what that means is that it's adjoint is equal to its inverse. Um, so these group C star algebras are an important class of C star algebras and they're very well studied. 
Uh, and you can think of this as another link between group theory and C-star algebra theory. Uh, but I don't really work with these guys that much, so I won't say too much about them. Uh, what I will say, though, is that this guy up here on the left-hand side, these are C-star algebras coming from directed graphs of groups. Uh, these are generalizations of group C-star algebras, and as we'll see in a moment, they are also defined using generators and relations. All right. So that's one way we can build C-star algebras. And then uh, another way we can do it is using what's called the crossed product construction. Uh, so if you start with any group action on a C-star algebra, you can construct a bigger C-star algebra called the crossed product, which somehow captures the group action through its relations. Now, I won't go through the details of this construction, but as the notation suggests, you can think of this as, an, uh, as the C-star algebraic analog of the semi-direct product construction for groups. Uh, and this is really what's happening up here. So this uh, C-star algebra here is the cross product coming from an action of the group G on this C-star algebra here. Okay, so now we've laid all the groundwork um, and now I want to talk about these C-star algebras in more detail. And so I'll start with the one on the left. So remember, these are the C-star algebras coming from directed graphs of groups. Uh, so here's a directed graph of groups, and I, I want to explain to you how we can define a C-star algebra from them. Uh, but first, let me just ignore the groups for a moment and talk about just what happens when we have just a directed graph. Uh, so the construction of C-star algebras from directed graphs dates back to the 90s, uh, and it goes something like this. So to each vertex in the graph, we'll associate a Hilbert space. And then the edges will become isometries between like the corresponding Hilbert spaces. So for example, this edge E here becomes an isometry whose domain is HW. This is the Hilbert space associated to W. Uh, and the range of this isometry is some subspace of HV, the, the space associated to V. Uh, and then this edge F goes the other way around. And then this edge H, because this is a loop, this will become an isometry where the domain is all of HV, but then the range will be some subspace of HV. And then there's some relation that uh, talks about how the ranges of these isometries should, um, should fit together. Uh, but then the C-star algebra of this directed graph is just the universal C-star algebra generated by these edges um, plus the relations that I talked about. Okay. Uh, so now let's see what happens when we put the groups back in. So the this construction for directed graphs of groups is something that I came up with in my research, but really this was just inspired by the construction for directed graphs that I just showed you, uh, as well as the construction for undirected graphs of groups, which was given in that five author paper that I mentioned earlier. Um, but anyway, so how does this work? Well, now we have groups sitting at each vertex, and what we can do with them is we can represent them as unitaries on the corresponding Hilbert spaces. So for example, GV uh, will be represented by unitaries on this space HV, and then similarly, GW is represented on HW. And the way I think of this is really as actions of the group. So GV will act on HV by unitaries, and then GW will act on HW. So those are the vert vertex groups. Uh, and then the way the edge groups show up is a little bit more subtle, and in particular, it's through this relation here. Uh, and this might look familiar to any of you who have studied Bastet theory. Uh, so the idea is this, you fix an edge, let's say E, and then you take a group element of the edge group. So let's call it G. Then because this edge group embeds as subgroups of the vertex groups on either side, the element G that we chose will have images inside these two groups as well. And I'll write alpha EG to mean the image of G inside the range vertex group. And I'll write e, alpha E bar G for the image inside the source vertex group. And then what this relation is saying is that if I first go along the isometry attached to E, and then I act on this on the range space by G, this should be the same thing as if I first act by G on the source space and then go through E. And so you can think of this as some kind of commutation relation that encodes how the edge group in how the edge groups embed inside the vertex groups on either side. And then the C star algebra of the directed graph of groups is then the universal C star algebra generated by the edges as well as these group elements here, subject to the relations that I talked about. Okay, 
So, so this is um, a brief explanation of what happens on the left-hand side. And so let me now move to the right-hand side. Uh, so remember, I, I told you that these, this is a, the cross product C-star algebra coming from an action of the group G on this C-star algebra here, the C0 functions on the boundary space. And this is in fact induced from an action of G on the boundary space itself. Uh, and so let me explain what this space is. So in the case of an undirected tree, um, the boundary of an undirected tree is just the set of ends of the tree. So this might be uh, familiar to you guys. Uh, and one way you can think of this boundary is as equivalence classes of infinite paths, where two infinite paths are equivalent if they eventually agree. And then if a group acts on the tree, then that will naturally induce an action of the group on the boundary space as well. Now, when we have directions on things, everything's basically the same, except that we require our infinite paths to always follow the directions in the tree. So for example, this red path here is still a valid infinite path but we can't go out through this way, right? Because then we'd be going opposite to the directions in the tree. So there's no boundary over here and also the same thing over here. Uh, but same thing happens if you have a group action on a directed tree that will naturally induce a group action on the boundary space. Uh, and then this in turn will induce an action of the group on the C0 functions on the boundary. And then this is uh, what gives rise to this cross product C algebra on the right-hand side. Okay, so now I've talked about both sides of the equivalence, and so now let's recap. Uh, so from Bastet theory, we get a one-to-one -one correspondence between directed graphs of groups and group actions on directed trees. And then I just explained to you how we can construct c algebras from both of these objects. And then my result says that these two c algebras are Marita equivalent, or they have the same representation theory. Uh, and so now I want to talk about what we can actually do with this result. Uh, and the point is that this Marita equivalence gives us two perspectives from which we can view what's essentially the same c star algebra. So we have one perspective as a cross product c star algebra, and then another perspective as a c star algebra coming from a directed graph of groups. And both of these perspectives have their advantages. So this cross product perspective, because cross products have, uh, are very well studied, we have lots of tools that we can use to understand their structure. And so this perspective makes it easier to study these c star algebras. On the other hand, it uh, turns out it's easier to construct uh, directed graphs of groups. So in particular, in a moment, we'll see that, for example, we can construct directed graphs of groups from just a pair of generalized adjacency matrices. Um, and in particular, we can construct them in a way that uh, makes the c star algebra satisfy some desired properties. Uh, okay. So those are the two advantages. And in the, the rest of my talk, I want to uh, illustrate how these advantages play out. So I'll start with the cross products perspective. Uh, so one thing we can do is calculate invariance of the C-star algebra in terms of the data of the underlying action. Uh, and so one example of an invariant is what's called K-theory. So for any C-star algebra, the K-theory of the C-star algebra is a pair of abelian groups, K0 and K1. Uh, very roughly speaking, K0 is related to the projections in the algebra, and K1 is related to the unitaries. Uh, and these two groups can tell us a great deal about this uh, C-star algebra itself. And one remarkable example of this is the Kirchberg-Phillips classification theorem, which says that the class of what are called stable UCT Kirchberg algebras, these are just C-star algebras satisfying some list of adjectives, uh, the class of these uh, Kirchberg algebras are in fact completely classified by the K-theory. And so this tells us that K-theory is a very interesting invariant to study. Now, we have some general tools that we can use to understand K-theory, and one tool that we have is what's called the six-term exact sequence. Uh, so if we have any short exact sequence of C-star algebras, that will induce a six-term exact sequence uh, in the K-theory like this. Uh, and we can use this to understand the K-theory of the cross product, by first putting the cross product inside a short exact sequence. So here on the right-hand side is the cross product that we are interested in. Uh, and then these two other c star algebras come from first expanding the boundary space to also include the vertices in the tree. So that's this guy in the middle. Uh, and then on the left, we just look at the vertices of the tree. And then these cross products fit inside a short exact sequence. Uh, 
And then this will induce a six term exact sequence in K theory, like so, uh, where the K groups that we're interested in are the ones here and here. So the reason I want to do this is because it turns out that while these, the K theory of this cross product is a bit difficult to compute directly, we can actually understand the K theory of these two C star algebras. Uh, and in particular, they will decompose as direct sums of the K theories of the uh, of the group C star algebras of the vertex stabilizers of the action. Uh, so this is something that I did uh, along with my supervisors, Nathan Brownlow and Thomas, as, as well as Jack Spielberg. Um, now, I won't go through the details of uh, how this works. It's a fairly deep result. But the point is, we can understand these K groups. And we can also understand the maps uh, in this sequence between the direct sums. And then through this six-term exact sequence, we can then understand the K-theory uh, of this cross product that we're interested in. And then because K-theory turns out to be invariant under Morita equivalence, uh, the result which I showed you earlier means that we can get a six-term exact sequence for the c star algebras of directed graphs of groups as well. So here is the c star algebra of the directed graph of groups. And now in the direct sums, instead of looking at the vertex stabilizer groups, we're just looking at the vertex groups in the graph of groups. OK, so we got so this nice. T0? Sorry, what is t0 and gamma 0? Uh, oh, sorry, this is gamma. Um, this is gamma 0. This is, um, I, I should have explained this earlier. Um, but uh, in the in the directed graph of groups, gamma is the graph. And then g stands for the, all the vertices. Uh, sorry, all the, all the groups. Yeah. And gamma zero? Sorry? And gamma, and gamma zero, zero is the, the vertex set of the graph. So in oh, okay. that model, it would just be so the T zero is also the, the vertex graph, the vertex set. Uh, uh, so T zero, yes. T zero is the vertex set of the tree. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. Uh, OK, so let's move back over here. OK, right. So we have this uh, six term exact sequence for the K theory of the directed graph of groups, C star algebra. Um, now, it turns out in certain situations, we can actually do a bit better than this, and we can get a formula for the K-theory uh, of these C-star algebras. So in particular, when all the groups of the directed graph of groups are infinite cyclic, or in other words, when they are all, all isomorphic to Z, then things become very easy to describe. So remember that all the edge groups have to embed as subgroups of the vertex groups. Uh, well, now, if everything is Z, these embeddings can be described just by a single integer, namely the image of the generator of the edge group inside the source vertex groups. And so for an edge E, I'll write NE to mean the image of the generator inside the range vertex group. And I'll write ME for the image inside the source vertex group. And then we can collect all these integers into two matrices, which I think of as generalized adjacency matrices. So capital N is the adjacency matrix of the graph where all the edges are weighted by the NEs. And then capital M is the adjacency matrix of the graph where the edges are weighted by the MEs. And then it turns out that the K theory of the, the C star algebra of these directed graphs of groups has this very nice formula. Uh, just in terms of the co-kernel and kernel of these maps here. And now this is really where the advantage of working with directed graphs of groups comes in, because if we tweak the directed graph of groups, we can tweak what these matrices are, and that in turn will affect what the k-theory of the C-star algebra is. Now, it turns out that if you uh, start with any pair of compatible matrices, you can actually construct a directed graph of infinite cyclic groups whose weighted adjacency matrices are the two matrices that you started with. Uh, and the only compatibility condition that you need is that the matrices have non-zero entries in exactly the same spots. And so that's just because the two matrices are supposed to be the generalized adjacency matri matrices of the same graph. OK, but given that, that assuming that that condition is satisfied, we can construct a directed graph of infinite cyclic groups with those matrices as the generalized adjacency matrices. And that gives us some control over the k-theory of the C-star algebra. Uh, now, it turns out we can do even better than this. So if you give me any two countable abelian groups, we can actually find two compatible matrices N and M, such that this expression here is isomorphic to the first group, and this expression here is isomorphic to the second group. Uh, and so what this means is that, okay, given any pair of countable abelian groups, we can construct a directed graph of infinite cyclic groups 
such that the k-theory of the C star algebra is precisely that pair of cannibal abelian groups that you gave me. Um, now, in fact, we can also arrange for this in, a, in such a way that the C star algebra is also a Kirchberg algebra. So remember that these are the C star algebras that were classified by their k-theory. Um, and okay, so I told you that k, the k-theory of a C star algebra is a pair of abelian groups. But for these Kirchberg algebras, it turns out that the k-theory is always going to be a pair of countable abelian groups. Uh, and so what I've got here is a way of constructing any uh, constructing a Kirchberg algebra um, given given any pair of abelian groups, countable abelian groups. And therefore, putting this together with the classification theorem means that every Kirchberg algebra is in fact isomorphic to uh, the C star algebra of a directed graph of infinite cyclic groups as well as its corresponding cross-product C star algebra. Uh, and this is very exciting from a C star algebraic point of view because it means we can use all the tools that we have to study cross-product C star algebras uh, and use them to understand these Kirchberg algebras as well, um, uh, which are more abstractly defined. All right, uh, so that's all I have for you today. Um, hopefully that was an interesting illustration of how ideas from geometric group theory can be applied in uh, another area of mathematics. Um, and so with that, I'll end here and thank you for your attention. Thank you. So thank you for a very nice talk. Are there any questions for Victor? So I guess I have a small question just for this final isomorphism you mentioned. So you mm -hmm. said that a, a, Kirchberg, a Kirchberg algebra can be defined quite implicitly, and then you have this kind of more explicit decomposition at the end. Yeah. Um, how much, I mean, how, how, how practical is this isomorphism, let's say, to do a meta question? Like, if, if somebody gives you a Kirchberg algebra, how, how much can you actually do using this to understand? Um, okay, so... Yes, the, the actual isomorphism uh, is very, like, not concrete. And so it comes from this, um, it's fairly, some fairly deep classification stuff. Um, so you don't get a concrete isomorphism here. Um, but yeah, you, all you get is this existence of this cross product C-star algebra. Um, and then, okay, if you don't care about what this particular isomorphism is, you can then use tools for cross products to understand mm. the structure of these guys. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like, for example, do you know any questions that, that are currently quite difficult for Kirchberg algebras that are, would be easier to solve using this decomposition? I'm... Yeah. So, so this is one of the questions that I'm interested in. Um, I'm not sure yet. So there is one question that hasn't been solved which is about whether you can lift so so if you have an action some group action on this pair of cannibal abelian groups can you always lift that to an action of the group on the Hirschberg algebra hmm. um so in special situations it's been it's known to be true uh, but it's not known in general um so one of the questions i'm thinking about is whether you can use this picture to to prove that in general but it seems difficult um at the moment, so I'm not sure. Yeah, but yeah, okay. it's a very interesting, um, very interesting question. Are there any other questions? Well, uh, no. In that case, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>